Ready, ready? I think so. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Hold on. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to move the head first. I mean, these are the concerns we have. Yeah, I mean, when I agreed to come here, you didn't tell me anything about following robots and kids. It's really, it's kind of unfair. It's a tough match. Yeah, no. But I believe Brady's the kind of person who can handle it. So without further ado, Brady Forrest. Hi. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's great to be at my first robots conf. Um, and so I, when I got the call to come here and spend a weekend with you, I was like, well, that's right before my entire class of 12 companies is uh, going out into the big world on Tuesday after uh, spending four months with me at Highway 1 in San Francisco. But I will fly out here, and uh, I am super excited to be here because I've been doing hardware for a while. I go to Burning Man every year, and when I'm at that huge festival in the desert, you know, that is my time to experiment. That's my time to play with things. And so back in 2004, some friends of mine and I built what could really only be described as a metal hot tub on wheels, <laughs> except uh, it was mostly like sweaty dudes, um, and it only ran for three hours. But, you know, that's Burning Man. And it was early on in the hardware cycle. You know, there were two PhDs on this project, three Microsoft employees, we had mechanical designs, and of course, we had amazing lighting. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, and this was in 2004. It was back in kind of an early time for, hard, for uh, amateur hardware. And so one of our PhDs, who happened to work at Microsoft Research, spent a lot of his Microsoft time that year designing his own motor controller for us. Uh, thank you, Microsoft. And like I said, this is 2004 BA, before Arduino. <laughs> this, I mean, these were like the dark ages. And none of the things uh, that I'm going to talk about were really around back when we were doing this car, which is why it took us so long probably why <laughs> it only ran for three hours, though the friendships have lasted a lifetime. Uh, and those things have changed. And so now, gosh, yeah, 10 years later, I'm uh, running Highway 1, which is a hardware incubator in San Francisco. This is what our demo day is going to look like on Tuesday. Here is Christina Mercando uh, launching Ringly which is a Bluetooth LE ring, very small, that connects to your phone. And if you happen to have your phone in your purse or your bag, it will alert you to it. Navdi is another one of our graduates. Uh, they're a heads-up display for cars. They came in with kind of like a, when I first spoke to them, they had a, a, like a projector table version of this. Then they had a shoebox version. Now they have like a much smaller module that you could actually put in a car. And along the way, we've had 35 companies go through uh, I'm quite proud of the fact that we've had six female CEOs of those companies. They've raised over $4 million in crowdfunding and over $30 million in VC. And all this is possible because of the following trends I'm going to talk about. It is now a great time for people who like to tinker, like at RobotsConf, to tinker with hardware. And it starts with Arduino. Before the Arduino came about, if you wanted to build a hardware project, if you wanted to dive into consumer electronics, if you wanted to connect your plants to the internet, you really needed to have electrical engineering expertise. But if you look on Instructables, it has really expanded into the many flowers bloom category. There are thousands of projects uh, where people have been able to connect their world, their homes, their lives to the internet, control it, all through this simple tool. And it's not just the Arduino that's allowed people to start building and to start making. Um, you, you go beyond Instructables, you also have Adafruit, where you can trust the tools that you're being built because it's curated packs. And I, mean, I think that Lemur and PT have done an amazing job of doing just that with Learn Adafruit and uh, their, a lot of their video series of teaching people how to be makers. 
Then you go to GitHub, and people are sharing the code. So I can go to Instructables, and I can figure out how to build a simple board, and I can go to GitHub and start to expand beyond that. And I think we'll all be uploading code to GitHub along the day today. And then suddenly, in around 2007, MakerBot exploded onto the platform and started to professionalize and uh, consumerize the RepRap project and make 3D printing something that anybody can, go, can do now. So even if you don't own a couple thousand dollar 3D printer, you can still go to a makerspace in a relatively nearby metropolitan center and get access to one. And then you have your IDE. And that's Tech Shop, those are hackerspaces, and there are events like RobotsConf, where people come together and they can work together in a place where the tools are available, where the platforms are available, and where the expertise is available. So, number one, prototyping is quote unquote solved. Anyone can prototype something. Now, once you've prototyped something, you still need the money. And that's where things like crowdfunding really comes in. And so this is a project, Circuit Stickers, that Bunny Wong, he's a, the nice gentleman who hacked the Xbox years ago, uh, has done. And it's a very simple project, but not one that would be able to get corporate backing or VC backing. It's all about putting little stickers, I mean, uh, LEDs and circuits on stickers, which allows you to use conductive thread, aluminum foil, copper tape. And this all came out of the MIT Media Lab, but then was actually produced in China en masse. So crowdfunding brings the dollars that makes these projects possible. And then finally, you have cell phone ubiquity. You know, previously, if you wanted to create a project, you needed to embed the interface in it, you needed to have a screen on it, you needed to have some way uh, for people to interact with it. But now, using Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, your phone can handle that. Your phone can be the interface, your phone can provide the data. And often you see a situation where the device you've created connects to the phone and connects, which is the little brain, and then connects to a larger brain where all the processing power happens. And that's what happens with Fitbit and Jawbone. So the quote unquote hardware renaissance, I think is possible because of these three things. Prototyping is solved. Crowdfunding really helps out with the dollars. And cell phone ubiquity. Now, I'm really thinking about my, my, where I come from is someone who has come up with an idea and wants to turn that into a business, wants to take it bigger. And that's what I mean by there is no China button, because scaling is still hard. You can make one thing, but making many things is where the trick is. Or, sorry, you can make a thing, but making a thing that can be made especially many, many times, is the real trick. And that's when you start to see messages like this. Now, this is from a Kickstarter project I backed going on, I mean, like three, two years ago, two and a half years ago. And they sent that message out six months after it was due. I just got it, and it still hasn't turned on. Um, and it harkens back to the early days of the internet when scaling was still difficult. Now, you all remember, perhaps, Friendster. Now, Friendster was a great site, but suddenly it became very popular. And they were in the early days of the consumer internet. They were in 2002, before Amazon Web Services. <laughs> um, and so they had to raise $40 million in capital and they spent that not on building out the product, but instead building out data centers to support all their users. And so slowly they, they, they slowed down, their users got frustrated, and now they're a gaming portal in Singapore. And I think early hardware companies had these same problems. The equivalent for that is sort of China. I'm going to go, I hear from people all the time, I'm going to go make this in China. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to throw it over to the factory. And the thing is, there is no China button. You can't just take your prototype that's wires, that's built on Arduino, and take it to China and have it get made. It doesn't work like that. 
it is a much longer process. And prototyping is just the beginning. So when I'm working with a company at Highway 1, we're working with them over here. This is where the manufacturing starts. So we're working with them at the design phase, when they're still trying to figure out what it is they're building. They know, I mean, they know the problem that they're trying to solve, but how are they going to solve that? Then the develop phase, when they're working on the most complex subassemblies. Then uh, the integrate phase, when they're combining them all together. And then finally, finally, if it graduation day for me, if they're at a looks like, works like prototype that is all in one, and they have, usually it's a model that they're holding with gloves that they've hand painted and printed out on a very expensive 3D printer, several hundred thousand dollar 3D printer, then I'm happy for them. I'm thrilled for them. Because then they have another several months to go through DFX, and that's design for manufacturing. How am I actually going to get this made? Design for assembly, DFA. How, how will it be assembled after the parts are made? Design for cost. What does the bomb look like? And then they start moving towards EVT, DVT, and PVT. Engineering validation test, design validation test, product validation test. And these are all scaling up. How am I actually making these? Can people other than me follow my instructions, follow my CAD, follow the tests, and make one to 10, a couple hundred, and then hopefully tons. And then it's around that tons time that you start to scale up. And that's when you actually know your release date. You know, one of my teams that came in, it's, they were a bunch of guys, and they came to us as we were uh, working on our second class. And they're like, we're going to go to manufacturing in June. And so I called over my best salesperson, my engineer, who took three, looks at, three minutes to look at the product, and then it's like, well, if you do that, you will end up breaking your board. You haven't designed your mechanical enclosure properly, and you will waste hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so they immediately said, OK, we'll sign up with Highway 1, and we'll come in. And they did start going to China shortly after they graduated in August. And they were originally going to ship in January. Just last week, they realized that they had gone too fast, too far, without enough tests. And they had to break their tool. They're currently retooling and pushing back to probably May. And this was a team that was already at the DVT stage. They've already produced 200. And they've realized that they have to go back to EVT uh, before moving on to the several thousand stage. So until you are at that kind of final step, you don't know when you're going to move beyond and into retail. So what I tell all the teams is prototype like hell. Keep shipping, keep shipping internally. Figure out what each prototype is going to test. So these were five nice guys that came into the program. And they wanted to redesign the baking scale. Because cooking is an art, but baking is science. If your ingredients are off, your cupcakes don't come out right. And that happens all the time in kitchens around the world, and they wanted to solve this. So with drop, as you're working with your ingredients, if you say if your recipe calls for three eggs and you have two, it scales down all the rest of the ingredients. And it tells you when to warm your oven. And it tries to really help you with the science so that you can get into the joy of baking. So they needed, this is their competition, the simple baking scale. So they started working with this. Well, so we have a bowl. Let's have it curved up. You know, most bakers work that way. Well, maybe we should just integrate the bowl in, and it would ship like that. But then that won't really work on shelves. And what if they want to use it for something else? And this is what they ended up with, kind of a teardrop shape. And it can be used for other things, like drop bartender so to help you mix cocktails. So it lets them go beyond just baking. And that's something they wouldn't have reached if they hadn't prototyped along the way. And I'm skipping a bunch of other uh, much uglier, cruder prototypes that they had. 
The other is learn from your customers. And that's the other advantage of prototyping. At each prototype, you should work with your potential customers. Maybe do a small run. Maybe do um, your own EVT. This company, Switchmate, three guys out of Stanford, they want to make it very simple to automate uh, your light switches in your home. And so they've now produced three different five-unit runs where they then send out to customers. And customers pay pretty much about cost. And from them, they learn what customers are going to do with it. And so this is what they first ship to customers. Say, basically magnets to snap onto the lights, and then a button uh, to change the lights, but then there's also a Bluetooth controller in there that will control the lights for you. And this is where they ended up. And what I don't have pictures of is the fact that they had to add a small rubber seal around the bottom because they realized that people were going to knock the switch mates off and that the magnets weren't going to hold them in. Um, they also made this removable, this kind of outer bezel, so that you can fit them uh, narrowly together, so it can either you know, fit over a, a regular size wall switch or a bunch next to each other. Your customers are your best method of feedback. And so I've actually been encouraging teams to, instead of going for the big Kickstarter, to do a bunch of small Kickstarters. And you see this with movies, where uh, movies on Kickstarter will raise money for the trailer, then for production, then for film festivals and distribution. And so I think we should move to that model with hardware. However, the key to that is to limit how much you're willing to take on. Because Kickstarter is not your destination. It's, that's not the end goal if you are trying to ramp up. If you want to make something that you just want to sell a couple thousand of, and that's your hobby, and you want to do a couple of the, you know, you want to do a couple of Kickstarter projects just for love, then by all means, that is the way to do it. But if you are actually looking to build a hardware company, it is not the way to do that. Take Ouya. Now, this is the Arduino-based uh, game console system. It sells for $99. Roy and Julie had gone out trying to raise uh, money to build this, and they couldn't. So they Luckily, we're in the position where they could raise a smaller round. They use that to then launch their Kickstarter, which then turned into many millions for them. And from that, they were able to build their product. But they always had their eye on the goal beyond that. So they didn't just sit with this $9 million. They went on to raise more from Mayfield, about $10 million more, using this to uh, get them to that next step. But when they started out, this is all they had. They did not have a business, but they were able to build that business on top of their crowdfunding success and move on. But then you have stories like Instacube. Now, Instacube uh, was something that I, that I purchased and backed, and the idea was electronic photo frame. It would show you your, your Instagram photos. They also raised quite a bit of money, six, over $600,000. But then they had to send this email. And as I said, you know, the somewhat happy story is they have actually shipped, but mine still doesn't work, actually. And there are now articles like this coming out. And they actually had to, a lot of people left the company over this. Uh, because of the harassment from people whose money they had taken. And they weren't ready to take their money. They didn't know how they were going to ship this product when they took their money and when they priced it out. So you can see, and I just tweeted this out on Brady, at, or on my, at Brady. This is a kind of looking at how much some of these companies like Formlabs, Misfit, Pebble, Ouya is not listed. Canary had raised prior to going to crowdfunding. So they went to crowdfunding from a position of strength. And they used that to then multiply the dollars that they would get on crowdfunding. 
A lot of the teams, when they come into Highway 1, they want to go immediately to Kickstarter or Indiegogo or Crowd Tilt or Crowd Supply. And I always try to hold them back because the longer they wait, the more they know, the better they can treat those customers that they've been working with. The sooner they can actually ship, or the better, the more likely they'll be able to ship on their promised due date. And the better their uh, post crowdfunding raise will be. Because you need to know your price. You know, pricing a product like this is incredibly difficult to do. It is not just the cost of your components that you need to take into account. There are a lot of other people who are going to help you get your product from your factory onto shelves. Now, if you're just doing direct web sales, then, of course, you control the margins a lot. But then you're going to have to deal with your, all your own marketing. You won't have any partners to do that. And unless you are an expert in that, it's not the way you're going to get to a big multi-thousand, multi-million dollar uh, unit sales. And I think we can look at a recent crowdfunding success, Coin, to see where they've had problems. So they launched their crowdfunding last summer, or no, uh, in 2013. And they just announced recently that they are delaying shipping by about nine months. They will ship you a beta card to limited number of users right now with limited functionality, and then you can pay extra. So what we can learn from that is DFM was still required. They did not know, they did not have DFM done. It has a limited functionality. Their component sourcing was TBD when they launched. Their pricing was unknown. They did not know their final bomb. And they overpromised on the dates, and they hurt their company by under-delivering. And that's the last thing that I think any company should want to do, especially a company that is asking you to trust them with their financial data, with your financial data. So here's, here's kind of a model that you might see for selling a product. And these are some of the margins. And this isn't even all of them. But let's say you want to sell it for $100. And you think your wholesale price is going to be $50. Which means, so what we have in there is your you're basically looking at a 50% margin for retail, which is about what you'll get at Best Buy. So your bomb is 18, you think. Your packaging is $2. Your kitting is $1.25, and your contract manufacturer margin is 15%-ish, so around $3.75. So your cost of product goes to 25. Your margin is 15, not bad. Your shipping is 6. Your sales agent, the distributor, the guy who gets you in the, the company or person, more likely, that gets you into retail gets four dollars of that. And I mean, this isn't factoring in your own marketing, your employees. What's bomb? Bomb? Sorry, bill of materials. Your your components, where you're getting them from. So, and that needs to be. Bunny Wong has a great talk where he talks about how you know you have to be very specific about which which exactly which LEDs you want and how uh, there are very common mistakes that can happen along those lines. So and how your bomb can be affected by being imprecise. So, kind of walking through this, let's say you got your bomb wrong, and it's actually $23.95. Well, then the margin of the contract manufacturer changes to $4.80, and suddenly the cost of your product is $32. Well, that changes your margin, because you're the only one who loses here. And now you're at eight minus seven dollars. And suddenly your margin is halved. And you still have to pay for marketing and your employees and where you are. And again, we're not really, in fact, a lot of people are doing connected products right now. And so there would be additional bomb costs. And just as an aside, I, I love what Spark is doing along those lines with a fixed cost around the addition of a Spark Core um, as opposed to a lifetime subscription. It's pretty awesome. So you can just add it into your upfront cost for connectivity. But so, I mean, this is just one kind of hypothetical example where a relatively simple bomb mistake was made, but it's a common one. 
and not as severe as I've seen. You know, you have your most important parts sometimes get end of life and suddenly they sh spike up in price. That's if you can even get them as a startup. Uh, you know, pre-certified modules cost 30 or $40 to include in manufacturing. If you can spend the $200 on your own certification, then you can drop that cost to $10. But is that worth doing prior to launch when you don't know if the product's going to be a success or not? When you don't have that extra $200 in cash and six months for testing? So do you launch with the $40 module, take a hit on margin, and then drive the cost down when you show success. These are all the type of factors you have to take into account with hardware. And this is before we really even get into the actual selling of the hardware. So after you've already crying because of your retail margins, one, you have inventory risks, actually getting it into stores. You know, there needs to be about 10 units per store if you have a deal with, say, uh, Radio Shack, which is 3,500 stores. That's 35,000 units. Then you have to deal with payment terms, usually net 120, meaning you get paid four months after it's sold. Well, you already had to pay your factory before it was made. And you usually have to have inventory going through the terms of, by about 10 weeks. So it's about a six month uh, stretch of working capital. Then you have retailer returns if it doesn't sell. And then you have the marketing costs in store because most of the retailers, sales agent, don't know how to use your product. And that's especially true at Apple. And then you have poor placement because you're just a startup, nobody knows who you are. Which is actually a thing that I think really you benefit from with uh, Kickstarter, is Kickstarter has a cachet for electronics. And so I think we'll increasingly see things like Kickstarter sessions, or sections, and probably, in, I assume, Indiegogo. But like Kickstarter has a deal with the MoMA. So you could end up in the MoMA design store for exactly that reason. And my friend Dan, who did, anybody here have the Robot Turtles game? Yeah. So I mean, they're gonna, when that, when that ends up in retail, and it may already be there, it's gonna have a you know, number one game on Kickstarter, big button emblazoned on the front, so you know, to attract attention. But this is kind of the sales life cycle that you see with retail. So you, know, you start off with your online sales, and that'll have an initial ramp because there's a buzz and TechCrunch has written about you and you made it to the top of Product Hunt, but then you know, this, you know, the 300,000 people of us who read those sites have all bought it, and then we've bought them for our spouses or partners, uh, and then your sales dip. So then you go to retail, and then you start dealing with the challenges that we're looking at. Then you go to mass retail if you're lucky. But then you're at end of life. And hopefully, you've already started to build another product here so that you can keep that wave going. And that's, I think, what you see with, say, Fitbit and Jawbone right now is where they have, and Misfit, where they keep coming out with additional lines of products that will get people buying into their platform, different use cases for the exact product all while keeping the data and building up the service around the consumer. So, prototype like hell. Learn from your customers. Remember that Kickstarter is not your destination. And make sure you know your price. Make sure you know your price before you take money from your customers, because it would really suck to lose money on every order you get. You will not make it up in volume. Because there is no China button. Scaling this stuff is hard, and it is a challenge, and it has hurt many and killed many a company. So uh, if you want to learn more from this, I'll be around for the rest of the day. Uh, I'm also writing a book with O'Reilly on exactly this with Rene DeRestra and uh, one of my engineers from Highway One, Ryan Vineyard, and all about this. And if you sign up, O'Reilly has this thing where you can download the chapters. A bunch of the chapters are already available. So, and we'd love the feedback as we get this ready for print. But this is also a great book, and this is what I read when I was taking the job at Highway One, or starting Highway One, really, uh, From Concept to Consumer by Phil Baker. So Phil worked at Kodak and shipped a bunch of cameras there. He worked with Palm. Do you guys remember the Palm Pilot, how there was this fold-out keyboard that you could have? My father had one. Um, 
that he did that. And so it's all about you know, his many trips from design studios in California and the US over to China to get it made. And then how sometimes manufacturing and marketing just didn't make sense. Because you know, kind of the big bugaboo that I didn't talk about on the retail pricing is you want to know what the customer will pay. And if the margins aren't there, if there's one piece of your bomb that is too expensive and suddenly kills your margins, then the product is actually just not feasible. And I saw that happen recently, it was about no, two years ago, where some people wanted to do a very cheap e-ink like postcard. But it turns out small custom size of e-ink screens do not allow for an under $50 product. And so just flat out, nobody was going to buy this kind of like shitty uh, e-ink screen that was low power for $80 or $100. And it just didn't, the product no longer made sense. And so they had to scrap their plans. But luckily, they, they scrapped them before they went to China, before they spent a lot of time iterating on that. And if you don't like dead trees, uh, the Blueprint, which is a sister site of mine, uh, has a lot of great interviews with probably some of the people who are here and a lot of other, uh, you know, CEO of Misfit, Ring, um, Nick Pinkston of Plethora, just talking about how hardware is made and how they got their products to market and how they failed many, many, many times along the way. And if there's one thing I'm going to leave you with, uh, it's that it's easy to make something, but it's hard to make something that can be made. And that is something that I learned from Sunny Vu, or heard from Sunny Vu of Misfit Wearables, and it is so true. All right, thank you very much.